Good morning. How are you guys this morning? I hope you are doing great. <laughs> Buster just went to the door because he thinks I'm talking to somebody. Silly dog. <laughs> we are just kind of getting everything started and giving everybody a little minute or so to jump on. I hope everybody's having a wonderful day today. Oh, that will be Mr. Jacob. Good morning. Good morning. How are you this morning? A bit tired. A bit tired. I feel you. I do. Okay, well, we are just getting started. So we're just letting people jump on and we're going to open up in prayer here in just a second. So we're just waiting for it to kind of kick over to 8 o'clock because we don't want to jump in and people not be ready for us. But I hope everybody's having a great day. It looks like it's going to be beautiful here. I think it's supposed to be like I don't know, like 90, 92 today, something like that. Personally, once it gets above like 85, it really doesn't even matter to me. It's just hot. Good morning, Benita. Good morning, Doug. Hey, JC Lynn. I hope you guys are having a good day. Mr. Jacob is on the phone with us. So we are just kicking it this morning. We are getting ready to just start our day. You can get coffee. Ed needs to get some coffee. I parked right in front of the coffee station. So bless his heart, he can't get coffee. Um, I'm going to open us up in prayer this morning, so if you guys want to, just join in, and we're going to bring this to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we call on you this morning. I call on you this morning. We ask you to just move in and through and with us as we learn this lesson, Lord. Just open our minds and open our hearts to the word that you have for us. You put this lesson here months and ages ago and you knew that on this day at this time that we would be looking at this word and you have a message for us lord and i just pray that we open our hearts and we hear it lord we hear it and we bring it in and we implant it in our hearts and we just make it a part of our world we don't just learn it and we don't just listen we actually Pull it into us, Lord, and we make it a part of us. And I pray this for every person joining us today and in the future. And I ask that anything that I have of this, that you block it, Lord. You don't even let it come out of my mouth. Satan, I forbid you to come through this phone. I forbid you to come through my mouth. I forbid you to come into my heart, into my home. I absolutely will not allow it. In Jesus' name, I declare that, Satan. And Heavenly Father, I just praise you and I give you all the glory for the technology that allows us to do this. And I just pray your anointing on me as I speak, Lord. Amen. All right, guys. We are we have a really good lesson today. I know. I know. I say that all the time. Let me shut my music down just a little bit here. It is, it's a really good song. Really, really, really good song. And uh, I am... Uh, I'm just really excited for what this lesson is going to bring for us. We've started a brand new chapter. For those of you who don't know, we're in a brand new book. Yeah, if you were at church with me, you would know that, by the way, because you would have your own books. Um, but this is our summer series. And so this series is all about living with hope. Oh, what a message. Living with hope. Now that, that's something we want to learn about. And today... We're looking at the basics for our hope. And so this is what we're going to dive into today. And for those of you who are joining us, we are in 1 Peter and we're in chapter 1, verse 1. So we're starting literally right at the beginning. And so I'm going to give you time to get there. And while you're getting there, I'm going to give you a little backstory on what this is all about. And Peter, just so you know, was one of Jesus' original 12 apostles. And he wrote this letter... Um, in the early, like, um, early 80s, 60s, so it would have been after Christ's death, about 60 years after Christ's death. And so that's when this letter was written. And it was written to the believers that were in uh, Asia Minor, which is, in today's world, it would be in Turkey. And um, they were beginning to face oppositions because of their faith. People weren't necessarily... And which, I mean, they faced oppositions from the beginning. But people were even more 
you know, because it had been 60 years since Christ had walked on the earth. So you have to realize that a lot of the people that were here when Christ walked on the earth would have been gone. I mean, they would have died. And so you're almost looking at a whole new generation of believers. And so they were facing a lot of um, opposition to their faith. And so Peter was worried about them. And so he sends them this letter um, because that's, you know, it's not like they could have gone on Facebook Live and just had a conversation. They couldn't Zoom with each other and have a meeting. Um, we are so blessed in this day and this time that we're living in right now that we can do this. And even to be living where we literally can do this because there are so many places in the world where speaking God's name and having conversations like this literally just wouldn't be allowed. I mean, would not be allowed. People would be coming through our doors and dragging us out. And so to live in such a time as this is amazing. And to be able to do this is amazing. And so like I said, we're in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. And I kind of liked it last week, how we kind of read the verses all the way through, and then we went back and dissected them. So we're going to do that again today. And so if you want to join me in standing, then you're more than welcome to stand. If that's not your thing, then you don't have to do that. But as we discussed last week, this is how I worship, so this is what I'm going to do. Oh, and just FYI, there are towns in here. I didn't go to seminary. I am not a Bible scholar, and I will do the best I can. So if I mispronounce it and absolutely destroy it, forgive me. I'm sorry. Okay. And this is a letter. This is a letter from Peter to the church. So take it as Peter is writing to you. And it gives a greeting, and it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those chosen, living in exile, dispersed abroad in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifi sanctifying work of the Spirit, to the obedient and to the and to be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercies, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefied, unfading, and kept in heaven for you. You are being guarded by God's power through the faith for a salvation that is already, already to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this, even now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer in grief in various trials, so that the proven character of your faith more valuable than gold, though perishable, is refined by fire, may result, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though, you, though not seeing him now, you believe in him, and you rejoice in inexpressible and glorious joy, because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Amen. Okay, let's kind of tear that apart and see exactly what Peter is trying to tell us. Because there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff in that verse, in those verses. And so if we jump right in at the beginning and we start out at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. That's where we're starting this today. I gotta have a drink of water. That was a lot of talking, by the way. Okay. So, the whole point of this message, the whole point that should radiate in you is that Jesus is the only source of true hope. Jesus. Not hand sanitizer, not masks, not um, six foot social distancing. Although, I'm not telling you to break the rules. That's what the CDC says. That's what, you know, everybody tells us. Yes, that's important. But true hope True hope is only going to come to you through Jesus Christ. And that's what Peter's telling us here in this message today. And so when it starts out and it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and that's who it's telling you that's who's writing you. And then it starts addressing you. And so it says, to those chosen. Ch 
chosen. Chosen. You are chosen. You need to understand that. It's, it's not, you know, to those who worked hard enough at it. To those who read their Bible enough. To those who, you know, gave enough money to the church. To those who did blah, 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 blah. All these different things. That is not what this letter says. This letter says to those chosen. Do you want to know who's chosen? You are. I am. Ed is. Doug is. Vanita is. JC Lynn is. Those are the chosen. Those are the people that Christ has died for. If you are in the sound of my voice, you are chosen. You need to know this. This is important. Jacob, you are chosen. If you can hear me, you are chosen. That is important. Oh, Ed says elected. I like that word too. That's a good word. Elected. Ooh, that's good. Okay, so in our book it says... Um, and life isn't easy for those who choose to follow Christ. I mean, you need to understand that. I've told you that before. Just because you decide that you're going to be a Christian and just because you give your heart to the Lord doesn't mean that it's easy peasy from here on out. It is not. It's usually very difficult because it tells you right there that you're going to face trials. You are. It goes on and it tells us, it says, living as exiles. Okay, so if you're living as exiles, you are, it's, you know, you're living in a different foreign land. And it, so it says that Christians weren't exiles only because they were living in a foreign land. We're exiles because this isn't our home. You know, people will, especially people ask me all the time because I moved in from somewhere else. And so they're like, so, so where's your home at? Well, in all honesty, I've lived here longer than I've ever lived anywhere in my whole life. So, eminence is, per se, my home. But my home, my home is in heaven. And that's what Peter's telling us here. He's, he's not saying because you're living in a different place than where you were born. He's telling you because this is just your temporary dwelling. Your home is in heaven with your father. That's where your home is. So, when it says you're living in exile... It's not necessarily meaning you're living in a different place than where you grew up or where you were born. It means that this isn't your home. This is just a temporary place for you to be until your father calls you home. That's your home. And it goes on and it says, um, chosen. I just love that. I love that word. I mean, he, he, he uses it twice in the first sentence of this, of this thing. You know, because it says you were chosen According to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Okay, so chosen, it, you know, he's reminding them and reminding us, God chose you. And it's important enough that he tells you twice in the first sentence. That is important. And foreknowledge means that God had knowledge before it actually happened. So God chose Terry Wood before Terry Wood was ever even born Terry Thomas, or according to my birth certificate or a little piece of paper, baby girl Thomas. Allie loves that. It tickles her to death to realize that at a certain point, I didn't really have a name. I was just baby girl Thomas. And so, but even when I didn't have a name, think about that. Even when I didn't have a name, God had already chosen me. When my parents hadn't decided what they were going to call me, God was already calling me his daughter. God was already calling me his child. So, before I ever even had a name, I was chosen. That's pretty, that's important to me anyway, I can tell you. That, wow, it makes my heart swell to know that. And he chose you too. But he gives you free will. He chooses you, hands down. From the beginning. But he gives you free will to choose him back. So you have to remember that you have to choose him back. You have to give your life to him. So remember that as we go through this lesson. And it goes on to say, May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Not just, I'm going to give you some grace and peace. It's going to be multiplied exponentially. 
we're going to times it out by like a million, trillion, billion, 564, whatever comes after trillion, I don't know. And it's okay to correct me. I understand that. I'm not a math person either. It's going to be multiplied to you. Now, you may look at it and say, okay, so I just got news for you. I am not feeling peace and I am not feeling grace right now. Maybe you're not. Maybe you aren't. It's very possible. Where are you looking for your grace and your peace? Are you looking to the news? Because that's not going to give you grace and peace. I can tell you right now. Are you looking to the internet? Even though I'm using it right now and I am very thankful for the person whose brain thought it all up. And I'm thankful for the person who thought up Facebook and Facebook Live and Zoom and all those other things that we've been using now. I am extremely grateful. But I can tell you right now, you're not going to find peace on that. You certainly are not going to find grace on that. You want to know where? You're going to find it in your handy Bible with all of its sticky notes and all of its markings and all of its highlighted notes. That's where you're going to find peace. That's where you're going to find grace. That's where you should be looking for it. So if you're not looking or if you don't have peace and grace, maybe you're not looking in the right place for it. Because it tells you in this verse that God's going to give it to you and he's going to multiply it to you. So if you don't have it, we need to start looking for it in the right places. Now the last part of that first part that we're looking at, verses 1 through 3, I want you to look, I want you to hear this. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth and a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Not just birth. Not just coming. It is a new birth. It isn't just anything. It is a new birth because you are a new person. Because you are a creation of God. You are his daughter. You are his son. You are important to him. He chose you. So hear that. Understand that. And he is your living hope. He's not just your hope. He is your living hope because he isn't dead. Jesus isn't dead. He died on a cross. Yes, he was buried in a grave. Yes, three days later he rose again. We just celebrated that a couple of months ago. He is alive. And he is your living hope. That is important. We need to understand that. We need to embed that in our heart. Hope, just so you know, is to believe in a future occurrence of something. What is your thing? If you have hope in your life, what is your thing? Because that's the definition of hope. Hope is to believe in the future occurrence of something. What is your thing? My thing, my hope, is that I have hope. I have a belief that I will live with Jesus in heaven one day. That is my hope. That is my belief. So what is your thing? Think about that as we go through this lesson. Okay, we're going to move on. And the next part of our verses are, we're still in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 4 through 5. So here we go. And into, that, into an inheritance, you're being born. That's what they finished up. That was the beginning. It says, because of his great mercy, he has given us a new birth and a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled. Sorry, my eyes are not the best. Undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Okay, so there's a few words in there we want to tear apart. Imperishable. I mean, number one, that's a pretty impressive word. Imperishable. Other synonyms for that are enduring, undying, and everlasting. I'm telling you, I need new context everlasting and in an inheritance just so you know in case you don't know this an inheritance is like a succession of a title or property for example our house my and Ed's house <laughs> he's trying to offer me his glasses um our house should something happen to the two of us is going to go to our children and their families 
more than likely they'll probably sell it because they all have homes. So more than likely it'll probably get sold and then they'll take the money from that and they'll divide it out among the four of them. And that is kind of their inheritance. I mean, you know, not that we're going to announce this on Facebook or anything, but if we die in an accident, just investigate the four of them. I'm just saying that. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Don't. No, we're very accident prone. Anything could happen to us. I'm not even kidding. But so an inheritance is a succession of property. And so it's telling you that your inheritance is imperishable or enduring or everlasting or undying. Your inheritance is undying. It's also undefiled, which means it's clean, it's flawless, and it's unsoiled. And it's also unfading. And unfading means it's indestructible. It's unchanging. And it's permanent. So your inheritance that's coming from, from your Father in Heaven is everlasting. It's unsoiled. And it's permanent. Nothing and no one is going to take it away from you. Nothing. This house, a tornado could hit. It could blow it down. Anything could happen to this house. Over time, you know, it could rot down if somebody doesn't take care of it. But my home in heaven, nothing is going to take, nothing is going to destroy it. Nothing is going to soil it. It is permanent. It is forever. That's important. We need to understand that. And it tells you that through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Salvation is a noun. I need you to understand that. Nouns are person, places, or things. So salvation is a noun. You can, you can have it. It is yours. It's yours for the taking. So salvation is the saving of something from an evil or a danger. So your father in heaven has already prepared for you an inheritance that's yours because you're chosen and he's giving you a salvation from something evil or danger. He's a pretty good father. He's taking really good care of you. This is actually a really good lesson leading up to Father's Day, which is next weekend. FYI, for all you people out there, Father's Day next weekend, get on the ball. Don't let those dads down. So, you know, God's power is like mind-blowing, honestly. So I want you to think about this and some of the things that God did that he told about in the Bible. God protected three young men in Nebuchadnezzar in a fiery furnace, and that can be found in Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 through 30. He guarded Daniel in the den of the lions. And that can be found in Daniel chapter 6, verses 10 through 23. And he shielded Paul from shipwrecks, beatings, hunger, and imprisonment. And that can be found in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 24 through 28. And despite facing intense persecution, the Christians to whom Peter wrote could trust that God's power was going to lead them to safety. So understand that our God is not just a God of whim. He doesn't just decide to do something. Our God is with us every day, every night, 24-7, 365. He does not take time off. He doesn't take a vacation. He isn't busy on another call. You don't have to leave him a text message. You don't have to send him an email and remind him. You don't have to wait for him to come back. He is there 24 7 365. He's just waiting for you to call out to him. Keep that in mind. So it goes down here and it gives us a question and it says, how does Peter's description of your, our inheritance give you hope in the present? How does Peter's description of our inheritance give you hope in this present? In the present that we are in right now. How does your inheritance in heaven give you hope? I would, I would pray that it would give you a calmness. I would pray 
that it would give you a sense of peace to know that in all of this craziness that's going on in our world right now, that your father, my father, has already prepared a place for us in our home that is always going to be there. It is never going to be taken away from us. It is there waiting for us. It goes on down here in our lesson and it says, We must be careful to never allow people or circumstances to rule our minds. Instead, we must continually renew our minds to his truth. And you do that by reading his word. This is why, it tells you right here, this is why regular Bible study is so important. Further, as a body of believers, we must encourage one another, helping our brothers and sisters to live out things God calls us to in scriptures. And this is in Hebrew. Hebrew chapter 10, verses 23 through 25. It was important enough that I wrote it out by hand so I could read it to you because it's that important. So in Hebrews, it tells us, let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us be concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works. Not staying away from one in, from our worship meetings as some habitually too do, but encouraging each other. And all the more as you see the, di, the, as you see the day draw near. So, God is telling us, lift each other up, encourage each other, be supportive of each other, and come together as a body of believers, just like we are now, just like we're going to do at 1045 when we meet, when we meet for worship, whether you're meeting for worship in the church or you're meeting for worship on Facebook Live. You're still gathering together. It's important. It tells us to do that. We need to do it. Okay, the last part of our lesson is on, we're still in 1 Peter, we're still in chapter 1, and we're looking at verses 6 through 9. And so it says, Rejoice in this, even though now, for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials, so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which, though perishable, is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him. And you rejoice in inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Amen. Okay, so Peter is telling us here, He's warning you right now as a Christian. He's telling, he's laying it on the line. He's not sugarcoating it. He's not trying to hide something from you. He's telling you, rejoice in this, even if for a short time you suffer in grief. Nobody on this planet rides for free. Okay? Nobody in this world is not going to face a grief or a trial of some kind. It is going to happen. Some trials are going to be incomprehensible that some of us can't even imagine. Some trials are going to be, they're just going to be a trial that you just have to get through. You just have to get through it. Um, this week at work, I had an audit. And so... The auditors come in and they literally like pick apart everything that I do. I mean everything. They look and make sure that every box is checked, that every I is dotted, that every T is crossed, everything. And so I, it has been working on something, he finally got it to work. I, I have a tendency to take this really personal, personal because something I've always prided myself on is that I do a good job. I mean, I worked at McDonald's. I did a good job. I worked for Bob and Eula at the license office. I was really young, but I think I did an okay job. Um, I worked at Burn Enterprises. I tried really hard to make 
you know, good designs and tried to be a good salesperson. And, and it was important to me. I started at the bank and I started, you know, as a teller and as a proof operator and, and gradually moved up to where I am now. And so I, it's, my job has always been kind of in my identity, which I should probably find a better thing than placing my identity in my job. Definitely should probably do that. But so it's, it's difficult for me when my job isn't as good as what I feel like it should be. And so that was kind of how this week was for me. And earlier this week, Ed would just tell me, he's like, she's only going to be there one more day. You only got to make it one more day. If you make it one more day, you're good. And so that's kind of how this week ended up being. And it was just a difficult day, but it was just a trial. It was just a tiny little bitty trial. It wasn't catastrophic. Nobody got hurt. Nobody in the family, you know, is in any kind of pain or sick or anything like that. That was just a teeny tiny little road bump. It wasn't anything worth being upset about at all. But Peter's telling us, you know, just because you say, I'm a Christian and I've given my heart to God, doesn't mean that the road is going to be easy. Sometimes the road's going to be even more difficult because depending on your place, I guess, you know, if Satan can get you to crumble, wow, look at the victory that he could possibly have. I always go back and use the big flood as an example of this. Uh, we had really just kind of gotten youth group started. We were really getting it off the ground and the big flood came and it took out the home, literally took out the home of our pastor and his wife. And it literally took out the home of some of our very prominent, very from the beginning, build it up youth members. And it hurt tons of businesses in town. And it hurt tons of people and their livelihood and their homes. And I mean, it could have been a time when, you know, our, our church could have focused on anything else other than our youth group because there was a lot of things that needed attention. But our church didn't. And our church leaders didn't. And our church prayer warriors didn't. And our church people didn't. They came together and we supported each other and we supported the youth and we supported the pastor and we supported the youth group members because it was just a trial. It was a rough trial, but it was just a trial and we made it through to the other side. But if Satan could have seen us fail, he'd have been dancing. He'd have been dancing and he'd have been having a really good day. And so... You know, you have to think about those trials that you're going through. It tells us in our book here, it says, Trials vary in nature. Trials come in all shapes and sizes. Trials are temporary. Just like my week this week at work. It was a speed bump. It wasn't that big a deal. Trials may seem long or our trials may seem short. Particularly in the light of eternity. I mean, think about that. Eternity, three little days are really not going to eat. I'm not even going to notice that. I'm not even going to remember that. Trials can bring grief. I mean, there are some trials that we face. They hurt our heart. I mean, they stay with us for a long time. And so trials can bring grief. And they can drain us physically and emotionally and mentally. But they're just a trial. They're just a season. We just have to get through it. Trials have a purpose. Just like it told us in our verse here, it says your faith is more valuable than gold. So if you, if you were a gold person and you were out hunting for gold, generally gold, it, you're usually not going to find a great big old rock of solid gold. That's not really generally how it's going to happen. You're going to find a string of gold that's veining through a rock. And you're going to have to get to that gold. You're going to have to dig down to it. So sometimes our faith, we're going to have to dig down to it. We're going to have to get to the core of it. And even when we find it, sometimes there are impurities in it. And so gold, when gold has impurities, they literally melt it down. I mean like to liquid. And they skim the impurities off the top. 
So some of our trials may cause us to feel like we are literally being melted down, that we are literally being undone so that those impurities can be skimmed off of us, so that they can be taken away from us and removed, so that when we lose our temper, when we shouldn't, that impurity is skimmed off of us. When we think that we can do it all, that impurity is skimmed off of us. God is calling on you to face some of these trials so that those impurities can be skimmed off. We can be relieved of those. And trials should result in rejoicing because God brought you through it. You very seldom ever are going to bring yourself through that trial. God is going to see you through that trial. Your other brothers and sisters in Christ are going to lift you up and they're going to give you prayer and they're going to surround you with love and that is going to see you through the trial. You on your own aren't going to do anything, I can tell you. It goes on and it says, um, hope. It asks us here, it are one of our last questions. Oh, I'm actually finishing close to on time today. I mean, I do still have a few things. But anyway, it says that, um, our last question, it says, what is the connection between our hope and our faith? Our hope and our faith. Our hope, which we read about in verse 3, is a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And our faith, which we read about in verse 9, because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your soul. So, both are gifts from God. Both our hope and our faith are gifts from God because He chose us. We aren't expected really to do there's nothing we can do to earn our salvation. Nothing. Nothing you can do can earn your salvation. God freely gives you your salvation. And Jesus freely gives you your salvation. And the Holy Spirit blesses you with salvation through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When we put our hope and our faith in that, then we are ready. That is your salvation. That is it. You you have it. You're there. You just God's just wanting you to bring others to it. He wants you to go out and tell people about it. He wants your life to reflect that. He wants the music you listen to to reflect that. He wants the movies and the TV shows and the games and the Facebook posts and all of your interactions with other people to reflect that. And if it's not reflecting that, then that's going to be a trial. That's going to be where that impurity gets skimmed off. Prayerfully, anyway. But he, the main focus is we must be careful to never allow people to rule our minds. Instead, we continually give our minds to His truth. So, no matter what's going on on the planet, no matter how many pandemics are coming, no matter how much chaos is going on, we aren't going to allow people to rule our hearts and our minds. The only one who's ruling our hearts and our minds is God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. That's it. Those are the ones who are ruling our hearts and our minds. That's what we as Christians are called to do. Okay, so we're going to finish up because I'm actually finishing close to on time today. And I'm kind of whoop, whoop, whoop. Thank you, Lord. And we're going to close it out in prayer. So... I am actually, this is um, one of my favorite artists. I uh, listened to this artist first. It's Travis Cottrell. And he is um, like a praise and worship leader for Beth Moore. And so myself and some of the ladies from church and my beautiful daughter in Los Angeles, we had the opportunity to go see a Beth Moore um, ladies conference in Nashville. Or in Memphis, I'm sorry. And it was... Whew, Miss Vanita was there. Um, Jerry Rader. I, yep, she was there. Linda Mosier. I mean, it was just a great, great, great weekend spent with some absolutely beautiful and wonderful women. 
And so this song has always been like, <sighs> because it tells us our hope alone is found in Christ. So we're going to finish this out in prayer. I just, I pray that you all have a wonderful day. And if I can help you, if you have questions about your hope with Christ or your hope being found in Christ, please just give me a message. Give Emily a message. Give Pastor Paul a message. Contact somebody and find that peace that he is giving us. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your gift of peace, for your gift of hope, for your gift of faith, Lord. We pray that we have the courage to implant it in our hearts, Lord, to walk out in your faith and bring your world, your word to a world that desperately needs it, Lord, to a world that is looking for something to put their faith in. Let us be your vessel, Lord. Let us be your feet. Guard our hearts and our minds and send us out into this world to be the Christians that you are calling on us to be. Anoint us, Lord, from our head to our feet and give us the words to say to encourage others and bring them into the fold, Lord. We are not just wanting to be people just walking around on this planet not with a purpose. You are our purpose, Lord. Salvation is our goal. And we want to bring every single person that is within the sound of our voice into the family. We want them to be a part of this world. We want them to be a part of your family. We want them to be our brothers and sisters in Christ. But to do that, we actually have to do the work, Lord. And we are asking you to anoint us and allow us to do that, Lord. Allow us to be your people, your workers, Lord. Just give us the words that you would have us say. And we ask this in your holy and precious name, Lord. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I pray that you have an absolutely amazing day. I will see you here next week. Bye-bye.